Well, it all started with the light bulb. You see, Edison was trying to keep the hot filament from flopping over, and he attached a little insulator to the filament and a little wire to the insulator coming out the top. And that held up the filament, but it also gave Edison a shock when he touched the supporting wire. And what he learned from that was never to touch the supporting wire. But other people started fooling around and proved that a current really would go from a filament through the vacuum to a little metal plate inside. And pretty soon everybody was sticking things into light bulbs. And one fellow came up with a winner. He put a little wire in between the filament and the little metal plate and discovered that a small current on his little wire, he called it a grid, would control the larger current going from the filament to the little metal plate. And that's amplification. What you put in is smaller than what you get out. And that's where we stop fooling with electricity and start to be fooling with electronics. And that using a small current to control a larger one is the basis for all electronics, from a Stromberg Carlson radio to a pocket calculator. Well, the vacuum tube hung around for a lot of years and made possible radios, TVs, computers, hi-fis, rather large radios, TVs, computers, and hi-fis. And because of the hot filament in these, most of the energy that went into them was used just to light the filament. And they had to warm up, and eventually they burned out. Well, the tube got very popular, though, and in the 1940s, science fiction writers were predicting that our whole lives were going to be run by huge computers that took whole city blocks and had millions of tubes in them. And that probably would have happened, except in the late 1940s, physics invented the transistor. And the transistor does exactly what the tube does uses a small current to control a larger one, except it doesn't have a hot filament. There's nothing to consume a lot of energy. It doesn't have to warm up, and it doesn't burn out. And the first transistors were so small, they had to be put into a package almost 50 times their size, just so human beings could handle them. The first transistor circuits were called discrete. That's because they used discrete, that means individual, components. If you look in the back of your transistor radio, you'll see a discrete circuit where all the little parts are in their own little packages with their own little labels, all connected to each other by wires. Here's a discrete computer circuit. It divides by two. It has transistors in it. Now, five of them will uh, divide by ten and so forth and so forth. Most of the space in this is because each little component is in its own little package, all connected to all the other components. Now, if you're going to need a whole bunch of these, why not try to reduce them all into one package, all the little insides of those packages in one package, the integrated circuit. This little chip contains two of these divide by two circuits. Well, computers got smaller again. Well, the story gets repetitious here because, you see, these things are designed on huge sheets of paper. And then they're reduced, they're reduced photographically to their final size. So if you're going to need a whole bunch of these, like for a pocket calculator or something, why not try and put them all inside one package? Large-scale integration. Here's a pong game we played with a few years ago. You put a quarter in it, and you played ping pong on a TV screen. It uses 50 integrated circuits from a computer. Here's a pong game we got for Christmas last year. It plays three games. Here's a pocket calculator. There's the chip that does all the computing functions. Now, the pong, the original pong game used uh, circuits from a, like were found in a computer. But the large-scale integrated circuits are unique. That means that the Pong game is only a Pong game, the calculator is only a calculator, and when somebody comes out with a more exciting Pong game or a better calculator, you gotta throw them out. They're no good anymore. And they're cheap to make, but they're not so cheap to design. So the last breakthrough is really one of thinking rather than technology. It's called the microprocessor. It contains all the circuits to build a computer. And when you bring one home from the store, it doesn't do anything. It's incapable of doing anything, but if you put a Put a keyboard on it so you can talk to it. And some memory so it can remember what you're saying. And a display so that it can talk back to you. You can start talking to it right away and teach it whatever you want to do. What that means for us is we're going to have a smart machine in the house pretty soon that we can talk to, interact with, and, and train to do what we want. And what that means to the manufacturer is when their microprocessor system is outdated or obsolete, all they have to do is bring it back to the factory and talk to it. 